Hello everyone, my name is Jasmine Johnson and this is my analysis of the novel The Boys in the Boat by Daniel James Brown. So The Boys in the Boat tells the story of the formation and training of the 1936 University of Washington varsity crew team who ultimately went on to represent the U.S. in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin and win gold. The story uh, is centered around the life of Joe Rance, one of the members of the crew team. And there's also a parallel narrative of Adolf Hitler, the members of his administration, and the measures they took to host the 1936 Olympics in Berlin, while ensuring that Germany was masquerading as a peaceful and tolerant nation. So the first theme I wanted to discuss is socioeconomic class. Uh, set in the midst of the Great Depression, this is a central theme to the book, especially the conflict between the working and upper classes. Many University of Washington students, including Joe Rantz, were, from the, were the sons of Western working class families, while others came from great privilege. With crew being a stereotypically upper class sport, the class divide was especially clear in the Washington Boathouse. Joe was often a victim of bullying by the rich boys and felt alone at times, but he eventually established a sense of camaraderie with other boys who were in the same boat figuratively. Soon Joe was able to find strength in his working class roots, both as an oarsman and a member of society. The next major theme I explored is uncertainty. Um, as I said, the Great Depression was an era of great uncertainty for everyone in the United States. Many people who had never had to worry about where their next meal was coming from or if they would be able to make ends meet were suddenly faced with these dilemmas. Uncertainty and instability as it relates to Joe's life were something that seemed to haunt him from a young age. From losing his mother to ultimately being abandoned by his family at the age of 15, Joe could never seem to find a sense of home. From a financial standpoint, he was independent as soon as he was um, abandoned and had to learn how to provide for himself. Upon making his way to the University of Washington and onto the crew team, uh, he faced a great deal of uncertainty with regards to his place on the team due to his inconsistent performance. One day he would be on the first boat with the varsity, the next he would be demoted to the third boat, the lowest on the roster. Once Joe perfected his technique and learned to trust his teammates, however, he became a staple member of the varsity boat and earned his spot in history. Which brings me to the next theme. Perhaps the most important uh, in the book is that of teamwork and the trust necessary to triumph in a rowing shell as well as in life. Further, uh, during their life, during their time, excuse me, on the team, Joe and the other boys came to learn that many of the values needed to be a good oarsman translated to life off the water. Rowing's an especially collaborative sport since a boat is measured not by how great each individual member performs, but by their combined efforts. Crew is also the perfect example of interdependency. Because of his unstable childhood, Joe was conditioned to depend on himself and only himself. However, Joe found that he was only able to keep his spot on the varsity boat by learning to be vulnerable with his teammates and trust that they had his back. As I mentioned before, this is a book about nine individuals, their coaches, and their path to the 1936 Olympics. However, Joe Rance is the central uh, character of the book. Born into a working class family with a very... Uh, unpredictable and often negligent father, Joe was led to believe that he could not be dependent on anyone for anything. He maintained this philosophy with regards to everyone, always keeping people at arm's length until he met the love of his life, Joyce, in high school. Joyce followed Joe to the University of Washington, and they were married upon Joe's graduation, eventually raising a family and spending the rest of their lives together. During his time on the crew team, Joe had to unlearn his sense of extreme autonomy and grow to become a true team player. Trust, respect, and care for one another were as important for the boat's success as the basic physical fitness and technique of each member. 
The man responsible for imparting this important lesson on Joe was George Yeoman Pocock, a British boat builder who had his who had his workshop in the loft above the Washington boathouse. Pocock was known as a rowing guru, and the Washington team's regular access to him allowed them to see him as a mentor and unofficial coach. Even the Washington head coach at the time, Al Ulbrichson, revered Pocock as an invaluable resource to the program. The first really exciting anecdote of the novel comes with the freshmen's first race against their Western rival, highly favored California in April 1934. California had just gone to the 1932 Olympics representing Team USA. It was the first time in the book where the reader's able to grasp Crew's popularity in the 1930s as thousands of spectators gathered to watch the races. Despite the odds, Washington's freshman boat finished the race a total of four and a half boat lengths ahead of California and set a new course record. Another great moment in the book is when George Pocock is finally able to make a breakthrough with Joe, allowing him to break down his walls and become a true teammate and friend. Coach Ulbrichson asked, had asked Pocock to keep an eye on Joe and see if he could help coach him. One morning, Pocock pulled Joe into his workshop and began the conversation by going into detail about his various tools and techniques with regards to boat building. He finished the discussion with an important message for Joe, one that would follow him for the rest of his life. He emphasized the importance of committing oneself to their endeavors fully and wholeheartedly with abandon. Joe walked away from that conversation with a newfound appreciation of what it meant to be a part of something bigger than oneself and what that entailed. The final noteworthy anecdote is the boys' Olympic victory in Berlin, essentially the climax of the book. The race was against Germany, Italy, Britain, Hungary, and Switzerland. The USA stroke rower Don Hume, the leader of the boat, was fighting a terrible cold and was in poor shape. Team USA was assigned the worst lane, the outermost one, which is the most susceptible to wind and current conditions, and they missed the starting signal getting off to the race behind everyone besides Great Britain. Using his intelligence and ability to adjust on the fly, the boat's coxswain, Bobby Mock, set the pace to get the boat to the front of the pack. Team USA crossed the finish line exactly six-tenths of a second ahead of Italy to win the gold medal. One thing I learned from reading this book, aside from the principal story of the University of Washington crew, was the powerful propaganda techniques implemented by Hitler and his administration in the preparation for hosting the Olympics. While the majority of the novel is centered around coach Al Ulbrichsen and his boys, the rest of the book focuses on the fascist Germany ploys to masquerade as a peaceful nation under the direction of Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, and the filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl, the Nazi party conducted a total makeover of the country, especially Berlin. They bust out, arrested, imprisoned, and hid away anyone deemed other. The Nazi party did everything in their power to completely manipulate the thousands of Olympic visitors who ascended upon Berlin into believing that Germany was the epitome of civilization and the Westerners, especially the U.S., let them do so. Overall, this is one of the best books I've read in a long time, and I would now count it among my favorites. The Boys in the Boat has been recommended to me on multiple occasions, and I saw this project as the perfect opportunity to read it. The writing was superb, and I really appreciated the author's ability to blend the perspective of multiple individuals together to create a rich and colorful narrative, including journal entries and personal stories. As a former rower myself, I really appreciated Brown's depiction of rowing as a fusion of beauty and strength in motion. The book was a beautiful retelling of a somewhat obscure story from the 1936 Olympics. It is remarkable that in a time of tremendous economic struggle in the U.S., a group of predominantly working class young men were able to represent their country in a stereotypically elitist sport after having proven themselves to be the best in the nation, and soon the world. Furthermore, the book reinforced my love of sports as a vehicle for success beyond the playing field, in this case, the water. 
So I realized that I went over the time limit of six minutes, and I hope I don't lose too many points for that, but I honestly could talk about this book for hours. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and furthermore, I hope it may have convinced you to read the book yourself. Thank you for watching.